Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning to those I haven't been able to see this morning. A very warm welcome to you. And last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I gave you a message for the head. And today is a message for the heart. Straight from the Father, through my heart, to yours. Now, sometimes it feels that the Lord gives me a message. Sometimes that message is for someone in the congregation. Uh, sometimes that message is for me. <laughs> So sometimes I feel I'm preaching to myself and you're just here to listen. But we trust that the Lord might teach us all something today. A little bit different today, what I'm going to do, I'll pray shortly. At the end of the prayer, I'd like you to keep your heads bowed because the scripture I'm going to read is a prayer. So it would be appropriate to keep our heads bowed. It's only six verses. And so I'll lead you through as I read the scriptures and then we'll finish up and we'll begin with our sermon. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather together. We thank you, Father, that these are people who do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. But Father, we recognise that it's important to come together, to worship, to build each other up, to encourage each other as we see the day approaching. And oh God, we just thank you that the Lord's return is soon. And we pray that you will help us to continue to work and minister for your glory. Father God, I do thank you for each person here. I'm thankful, Father, for the love and support of my family. He who finds a good wife finds a good thing. And I thank you, Father, that you blessed me with the best possible wife for me. And Lord, for children, I thank you for them. Heartbreaking, Lord, to read in the paper this morning that some couples contemplate abortion if they don't get the gender of the child that they want. Lord, that's abhorrent and we pray that that would be outlawed. But I thank you, God, that you gave me one boy and one girl. And we thank you for the blessing of each. And Father, we just pray that as we step onto holy ground this morning in your word, that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes and open our spiritual ears to hear and to see what you would have for us this morning, that it would be a message of encouragement that it would encourage each heart and, Lord, we can use these words to also encourage others around us because we know that there are many that are lost, they're sinking in their sin, but, Father, there is a remedy and his name is Jesus. And we thank you for his blessed name, for the person and the work of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us. In his name we pray. Amen. So, Father, as we turn to the Scriptures, we see what David had to say and we pray along with him. In Psalm 13, Father, David cried out to you, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Lord, we thank you for the words of this Psalm 13 from David's heart. And we pray that you would lead us this morning as we study these passages. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Psalm 13, if you'd like to turn to the Word of God, six verses. Six verses we just read. Is this really the man after God's own heart, lost in a sea of despair? David was the selected man of God, but now he's a man of sorrow. He was a singer of praise, but now he is a man of anguish. He was a soldier of God, but now a man of despair. Though unknown to many, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, was in some seasons a sunken prince. The time of Spurgeon must have been very spiritually intense. Two weeks ago, I spoke about Karl Marx. He and Spurgeon lived during the same period, but both had very different messages for mankind. 
Marx spoke about revolution. Spurgeon spoke about regeneration. Marx argued that salvation would only come when man spilt blood through uprising. But Spurgeon testified that salvation would be found in Christ, who shed his blood for mankind. Marx tried to raise a riot by using the working class. But Spurgeon was most popular among the working class. Marx wrote that communism abolishes eternal truths. But Spurgeon testified that the word of God stands forever. But even knowing the truths of God intimately, Spurgeon once said in a sermon, my spirits are sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child and yet not know what I wept for. It echoes the cry of Psalm 42 verse 5 wherein the psalmist proclaims, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. You see, if the great king of Israel and the prince of preachers felt like this, surely we are not immune. Even the most joyous Christian will sometimes find themselves in a season of doubt and darkness. But none of us want to linger there. So not wanting to linger there, how can we fight through this, these seasons? How long has been a refrain through many ages, out of many lips? In the space of two verses, David echoes the haunting cry to the Lord four times, desperately wanting to know that, the God, that God was going to deliver him from his suffering. David probably felt justified in asking since he had many difficult years. In fact, so uncertain did David feel that in 1 Samuel 20 verse 3, he said, there is but a step between me and death. And although Psalm 13 is only six verses long, David is able to deal with his feelings, his foes and his faith. See, many believers will experience times when God seems far away. The times when you pray, but God feels distant. The times when you read the Bible, but it doesn't speak to you. You seek God, but he seems to be hidden. Those times when the God that you have walked with for so long, depended on for so long, talked to for so long, served for so long, feels no longer within reach. That somehow you're outside of the stronghold of safety within God, desperately trying to get back in. And I suppose quite deliberately, Psalm 13 is very neatly broken down into three very small parts for us. Verses 1 and 2 present a problem. Verses 3 and 4 show a petition. And verses 5 and 6 end with praise. As you read the psalm and picture David praying it, you can sense the magnitude of the turmoil. It begins with great anguish over his circumstances, but decreases in magnitude as pain turns to praise. The emotion in the psalm is like the sea, starting off as big waves threatening to crash upon and consume the psalmist, but ending in a ripple as turmoil gives way to the calm response of knowing that God is merciful and he is good. See, sometimes when God feels distant, we must still call to him and remind our soul to trust in his unfailing love. Spurgeon too saw his troubles as ordained by God for God's own glory and his own sanctification. Spurgeon said, it would be a very sharp and trying experience for me to think that I have an affliction which God never sent me, that the bitter cup was never filled by his hand, that my trials were never measured out by him, nor sent to me by his arrangement of their weight and quantity. God knows the perfect weight, the perfect quantity of the cup that he sends to you, that he delivers to you, so that it will produce in us the necessary conditions where his plan and purpose might be fulfilled in us to be able to bring out of us the sweet fruit of the Spirit. There's an old hymn from 1787 that brings light to our eyes concerning this subject. It reads as follows. Dear Lord, though bitter is the cup, thy gracious hand pours out to me. I cheerfully will drink it up 
that cannot hurt which comes from thee. Tis filled with thine unchanging love, and not a drop of wrath is there. The saints forever blessed above, we're most often afflicted here. From Jesus, thy incarnate Son, I'll learn obedience to thy will, and humbly kiss the chastening rod when its severest strokes I feel. See, when suffering's great shadow has been cast over you, in these moments it's easy to believe the lie that God has no purpose for you. That God has no use for you in blessing others. Because this is exactly where the enemy wants you in those moments, in those seas of despair. He wants to prevent us in those moments from ministering to others and being ministered to as well by the word of God. Don't ever believe that your suffering makes you useless for the ministry of God because a rich ministry flows from your own well of suffering. If you trust the sovereignty of God, further trust him to use every suffering he has ordained in your life to bring him glory for your sanctification and for his glory. We can trust God to take you from pain to praise, from suffering to settling, from tears to triumph, from weariness to worship. Friend, you cannot go through this life skipping from mountaintop to mountaintop. At some stage, we're going to have to go through the valley. But the valley is not to be feared because the valley as well is a place of blessing. But people fear the valley because they believe they have to walk it alone. No, this is the God who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the great shepherd of the sheep who comforted David by saying, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But in Psalm 13 so far, as David is concerned, he was not only in turmoil about what his enemy was doing, he was concerned about what the Lord was not doing. You see, sometimes when the gaze of our soul leaves the trustworthiness of the rock of ages, we start to question the circumstances that we see. And so in trials, sometimes that blurs our vision. That's when the frustrations start to build, when our vision is blurred of the great God who can sustain us. If we don't see the Lord being active in our own lives or in our churches or in our communities, we believe him to have turned away. Where are you, Lord? The soul cries out. We were taught to pray that God would supply our daily bread. But what do we do in those moments when the bread supplied seems to be the bread of sorrows? But the bread of sorrows is often the diet of the saints. The heartfelt cry of the soul flows from the deep pain, which can only be properly addressed with a deep remedy. Deep pain needs a deep remedy, and there is none better than the deep presence of God. Deep calls to deep, as Psalm 42 says. The Hebrew word translated in the psalm as deep refers to the deepest depths of the sea. The anguish as if one had lost all footing and the feeling of recurring waves of trouble has plunged the soul deep into the bottomless ocean of, of sorrow and despair. The deep of man's need calls unto the deep of God's presence. But sometimes we don't know the depth of our need unless there is a longing there. When we have moved away from him, he allows us sometimes to feel the pain of the distance so that we come to understand that we must run back to him. But we must also recognise that sometimes this happens because of divine discipline. And there is perhaps none better to study than Jonah. Let's turn to the book of Jonah. And in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2, verse 3, he testifies as follows, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surround me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yes, sometimes we 
feel we are constantly going down. But sometimes we contribute to that. Jonah was going down since he rebelled against God. He went down to Joppa. He went down to the sides of the ship. He went down into the deep and finally he went down into the whale's belly. You know, when you deliberately turn your back on God, the only way is down. But how was Jonah saved from his bad decision? Read the rest of verse 4. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Go to verse 6. Toward the end. Yet you have brought me up. You have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. And verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. When Jonah was going down, 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 the only way he could turn that around was to go up, up, up. But what if you feel too weak to go up? What if you constantly feel if you are going down no matter what you try? Many have asked this of the Lord. There is no shame in doing so. Those times when we ask very serious questions of the Lord, those times when you get really, really honest with God and you say, God, you said I'm loved, but I can't feel your love right now. You said that once I decided to follow you, that you would never leave me nor forsake me. But in this moment, I can't feel your presence. I can't feel your peace. I can't feel your power. So where are you, Lord? Why are you hidden from me and how long, how long is this going to last? Now, you might believe it's inappropriate for a child of God to turn to God and say to him, how long, how long is this going to go on? How long until you restore my soul into your deep presence? If you read enough of the Psalms, you'll see it. You'll see it repeated all the way through. It is a common refrain. Common, but is it appropriate? I believe that if your heart is right with God, it is appropriate. The question is even posed in the book of Revelation, the opening of the fifth seal. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? But to distinguish between what are mere complaints, what are mere complaints, and what is the deep anguish of the soul, Matthew Henry had these wide words, wise words. We should never allow ourselves to make any complaints but what are fit to be offered up to God, but drives us to our knees. If your heart is not right with God, the question, how long, suggests that we want God to hurry up and finish his work so the suffering may pass and the settling may begin. Sometimes it feels that God moves ever so slowly, particularly when we pass through a trial. Don't you understand, God? How painful this is. Don't you understand that the longer this suffering, this trial goes on, that I am in pain? Don't you understand, God, that I ache for deliverance from this trial? Because trials are never one-dimensional. And what I mean by that is that they involve all of us. The physical, the psychological, the spiritual, all under heavy trials seems all to hurt. And we ache for deliverance from it. Every part of us is under pressure at once and we plead with God to bring it to a close so that the pain may subside. But sometimes, hurry, 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 God, is just met with a brick wall where God says, wait, 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 wait until I've done my good work in you. An old preacher by the name of Philip Brooks, he was a normally calm man. One time a friend came across him, he was pacing the floor like a caged lion and a friend said to him, What's the trouble, Brooks? And he said, the trouble is, I'm in a hurry and God isn't. Sometimes we find ourselves in a valley of decision and that 
is where the enemy likes to strike. He likes to strike when you are down in the valley, when you feel alone, when you feel that you're abandoned, when you feel that there is no one walking with you in the valley. In those times, the enemy is going to say some things to you. He's going to say to you, you're a disappointment. You have nothing to offer God. That nothing you ever do is going to be good enough for God. That you are weak, that you are ineffective, that you are pointless, that you are too small to affect anything for the kingdom of God. And then he uses those three words that no Christian ever likes to hear. Just give up. That is what the enemy is going to say. And in this valley of decision, you have a choice. You can give up or you can surrender. Same thing you say. If you're a soldier of a national army, you might think that giving up and surrendering are the same. If you're a soldier of the cross, they're entirely different. If you give up, it illustrates hopelessness. That you have no faith in the power of God to sustain you and to deliver you from your circumstances. But on the other hand, if you surrender, if you surrender to God, that demonstrates your belief that you know you have no power within yourself to deliver yourself from your own circumstances, but God is going to do it. God is going to sustain you through the trial and that he is going to deliver you. And that while you're waiting on God to deliver you, you rest on your faith. You see, David eventually learned to replace the question, how long, with an affirmation found in Psalm 31. Let's turn there. Psalm 31, chapter 14. Psalm 31, chapter 14. But as for me, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. You see, the best thing you can do when God feels distant is to call out to him in faith. Call out to him. But instead, many immature believers just shrug their shoulders and say, oh well, God's distant. So what? Does it make any difference in my life? They just go back to the world seeking help. David didn't do that. When God seemed distant, he called on him to answer him. Answer me, Lord. How long is this going to continue? How long until you restore me? Instead of turning from God, as a lot of Christians have a propensity to do, he went to him and he constantly went to him to plead with him. And this is where faith wins over feelings. You see, David started with his feelings. Psalm 13, he started with his feelings, but he ended with his faith. Feelings don't save you. Faith does. Feelings won't sustain you in this life. Faith does. And feelings won't deliver you. Faith does. God needed to take David from feelings to faith in order to take him from sinking sand to solid ground. Because our heart is restless until it rests in the Lord. In verse 3 of chapter 13, David asks God to enlighten his eyes. You see, in the scriptures, light in the eyes represents vitality. And we know that even as human beings, that in every person, except maybe sociopaths who have no feelings, in most human beings, you can see just by looking into someone's eyes if they have vitality or not. That's when my wife can tell if I've got a migraine, she can see it in my eyes and we can see in each other's eyes whether they have vitality of life or if they are suffering. And, God, and David's wish is that God would replace his dim eyes, which had grown tired from tears and suffering. Psalm 6 verse 7. Psalm chapter 6 verse, verse 7 says this, My eye wastes away because of grief. 
It grows old because of all my enemies. Psalm chapter 38. Psalm 38 verse 10. My heart pants, my strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. When Job spoke about this, Job chapter 17, verse 7, he says, My eye has also grown dim because of sorrow, and all my members are like shadows. You see, David was sensitive to the presence of God in his life. And if he lost the sense of God's presence, he went after it with a holy fervor. And I believe that every true believer in God should be like that. But a significant problem for the church at large is that believers are not stirred up for the Lord. Don't get me wrong, Christians get stirred up. Some people get stirred up if someone takes their place in the church car lot. Some people get stirred up if you come in and someone's sitting in your seat. Some will get stirred up if their favourite preacher isn't speaking, their favourite hymn isn't being sung. People will get stirred up if the sermon goes for too long. But sometimes people don't get stirred up for the Lord, stirred up in the right ways and to work and to minister for the Lord. And the fervent fire of the Philadelphia church age has been unfortunately replaced by this lukewarm Laodicean era and with it a ruined testimony which few care about. Consider the time of Nehemiah. There were plenty of other Jews in Jerusalem and they'd been there a long time but they had no concern for a broken down wall and a ruined testimony. But they didn't understand that this is this was a reproach to the name of God. They were perfectly satisfied with things as they were but it was a reproach. It was a reproach to the name of God. But Nehemiah was a man with a burden who had been sent and supplied. He was a man with a vision and vocation. He was a man whose attitude was a declaration of war against things as they were because God sent him to retrieve ground that was once lost. He declared war against things as they were, this complacency. This broken down wall and ruined testimony, that wasn't good enough for Nehemiah who knew the great and wonderful God. In your spiritual life, you have a choice. You can give up more territory to the enemy or you can fight for ground once lost. But if you want to fight, if you want to fight, you don't have to. God gives free will to everybody. If you want to fight for ground once lost in your spiritual life, you have to be stirred up for the Lord God. 2 Timothy 1.6 records this, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Therefore, to to prevent yourself from taking on these wrong thoughts or wrong emotions, you have to have something inside of you that you need to keep stirred up, to stir up for the Lord. And the verb he uses here is in the present tense. This isn't talking about a past stirring, a past fire that you've had for the Lord, which has gone out. This is a present, ongoing stirring that you must keep stirred up. He's reminding him to continually keep his soul stirred up for the Lord. Note two, let's turn to it in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. Two Peter chapter one. We're going to read at verse ten through to fifteen. Two Peter one, verse ten. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. 
Moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So the word he is using here is something like an awakening, like a fire that is just about to go out and someone blows on it. Kindling is added and it roars back to life. Friend, that is what we need in believers right now. Something or someone to stir the life of the believer so that their spiritual life comes back to fervent heat once again. But note the similarity in our passages between 2 Timothy and 2 Peter. There is an emphasis on remembrance. And one of the greatest tools that God can use to aid our stirring is to remember. Spurgeon said there is great perversity in man that we forget that what we should remember and remember what we should forget. But God can and does use our memory to remind us of great things which have happened in the past which should bring a stirring to our soul. David realised this when we come to verse 5 in Psalm 13. Back to Psalm 13, verse 5. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You see, he reaffirmed his trust in God by using a word that you'll hear Noel use, you'll hear friends of Israel use quite often, chesed, God's chesed. It is the Hebrew word for mercy or loving kindness. It is a word that is rooted in God's covenant with Israel, his covenant promise, his covenant love. And David demonstrates that his trust was not in himself. We cannot trust in ourselves. We have no power, no strength to deliver us, to save us. But he was trusting in the one, the God who promised that he would show covenant and faithful love to his people Israel, even in spite of the fact they turned away from him. Now, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he encouraged him to stir himself up. You see, if you wait for somebody else to stir you up, you might be waiting an awfully long time. You shouldn't wait on me to stir you up or a particular song to stir you up. If you want to be a servant of God on fire for the Lord, you have to be able to stir yourself up. William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, once said to a group of new officers, I want you young men always to bear in mind that it is the nature of fire to go out. You must keep it stirred and fed and the ashes removed. How true he is. By its very nature, fire just wants to go out. If you stop feeding fire, it will go out. And when do campfires typically go out? When the campers are sleeping. And I believe this is widespread in the church. The fire of Christian work and witness has gone out. Because the enemy has been, because Christians have been lulled to sleep by the enemy. The enemy isn't going to wake you. The enemy is not going to stir you out of your slumber because the enemy wants you to sleep. A sleeping church and a sleeping Christian is no threat to the devil. But what, we, what might we say? Awake! Stir yourself! The Lord is returning, the prize within reach. Mankind is lost, but the remedy is sure. Onward is the Lord's command. Onward with the saving message of Jesus. We're not living in the Garden of Eden. We are living in the time of the Garden of Gethsemane. And now is not the time to take your rest. We must ask God to stir us up, to stir ourselves, to fill us afresh with the Spirit to Enable us to live continuously in line with the will of God and save some, save some for the Lord Jesus Christ. This should be the prayer of the last day's church. But the last day's church is comfortable, comfortable in its riches, comfortable in its wealth, comfortable in the fact that no persecution has largely come to the Western church. It's coming. I guarantee you it's coming. And before that day comes, I'd encourage you, stir yourself. Because when those days come, Christians who are not walking with God, Christians who have been lulled to sleep by the enemy, they'll be destroyed by the enemy. The sleeping church is no threat to the devil. 
But a church that is awake, a church that is on fire for the Lord God, that is a threat to the devil. C.T. Studd once said, Christ wants not nibblers of the possible, but grabbers of the impossible. You know, sometimes I think we reduce our prayers to what we believe is possible rather than what is impossible. We serve a God of infinite power and infinite resources. So let's start praying those prayers that seem impossible to us because they are possible to God. Praying that he would perform mighty works through this church which seem improbable and impossible to men but will bring him glory and bring souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he mentions some circumstances which might dampen the fire. And so he warns Timothy about three things. Three things that can dampen the fire within the soul of Christian warriors. Being ashamed, being afraid and being afflicted. Let's turn to, to Timothy to explore further. To Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. To Timothy 1 verse 8. We'll read through to verse 12. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who, was abol who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. It's hard not to break out in song when you get to that part, isn't it? What a great song that is. You see, what counteracts shame? Love. Love counteracts shame. An all-consuming love for Jesus that cares not what other people think. Remember the time when you fell in love. You fell in love with the person you're with. You didn't feel any shame. You didn't care what other people thought. You knew that you loved that person. You loved them with all your heart, with all your mind. Your attention was fixed on the one that you love. Remember, I've quoted Vance Havner in the past about revival. Revival is simply about God's people falling in love with Jesus all over again. Love counteracts shame. Being afraid. Paul reminded Timothy that the flame would be dampened if Timothy was afraid. Read verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. If you look at the Greek word here for fear, it refers to a person who has fled from battle. Years ago, there was a story about a Christian who was in prison because of his faith. He was to be burned at the stake and he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to endure the suffering. So one night he experimented by putting his little finger into the flame of the candle. And you can imagine he withdrew that pretty quickly. And he said to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to disgrace you. I can't even have my little finger in the flame. How am I going to be able to bear to be burnt at the stake? But when the hour came, he praised God and he gave a noble witness for Christ. God gave him the power to endure when he needed it. Not before, when he needed it. God gave him the power. You see, if you flee from the battlefield before the fight, you are ignoring the power that the Holy Spirit can give you in the battle. Wait on the Holy Spirit and he's going to give you the power you need. But if you succumb to the fear... You cannot prove the Spirit's power in faith. But what counteracts fear? Faith. Read verse 13. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith 
and love which are in Christ Jesus. And you know what? If you grip faith in one hand and love in the other, all of a sudden you've got nothing to grip fear with. Your hands are already occupied in faith and love. Fear you cannot take a hold of. Number three, affliction. Turn to chapter 2, verse 3. He says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul knows that if Timothy is afflicted, the young man's spiritual gift might be left dormant and his testimony might cease to burn brightly for the Lord. Many believers run their race well until faced with adversity. How many Christians do you see walk away from the battlefield once adversity hits? Once the affliction really hits, that's when some flee. But as in, as in our previous two examples, there is godly provision for counteracting this tendency. It is hope. Hope counteracts affliction. What will enable us to stir up the fire within us, even during affliction? The real and blessed hope of the Lord's return. That's what gives us hope. He is described as our blessed hope. The imminency of the rapture should be like a fan to the dying embers of our spiritual enthusiasm. And that's why the enemy has fought so hard to keep the rapture out of pulpits. Because he has removed hope. He has removed hope from the Christian, from the hearts of believers. And with it, the fire that should burn within the believer, knowing that the Lord's return can be any moment. So, in conclusion... Whatever their intensity, all trials are designed to bring us closer to God. He wants to have a deep and abiding presence with us. But if we dodge, if we try to dodge the suffering, if we try to dodge those lessons, he's not going to be able to mature us. It's all about, Noel's spoken a lot about spiritual maturity. This is the goal, more Christ-like. So God uses these to build maturity in us. You see, David came to the point of trust, and every believer can come to the point of trust as well. Uh, sometimes, when you're a spiritual babe, trusting God is really hard. But over time, God shows you how trustworthy He is. And often, He does that by using trials and temptations. But you see, when we come to the end of verse 6, David's circumstances hadn't changed one bit from the start of the psalm, nothing had changed in his physical circumstances but what had changed was David's focus from focusing on himself in verses 1 and 2 to focusing on his enemies in verses 3 and 4 David now focuses on God in verses 5 and 6 you see his view went from inward to outward to upward and that is how you go from pain to praise Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this brief time to gather around the Psalms and other scriptures. We thank you, Lord, that each of these scriptures is designed for our knowledge, to increase our knowledge, to increase our grasp of how you work in our life. And we do thank you, Lord. We thank you for everything that you do in our life, everything that you've designed in order to help us to trust you more and father god we just pray that as we close these words this morning that you would help us to carry them in our heart and father we know that there are many believers in countries where the word of god is outlawed made illegal by governing authorities but father god those christians just commit them to memory how great that is lord we pray that your work within persecuted countries might continue that, Father, you would just continue to build your church, particularly in those countries that have tried to eradicate Christianity. The Chinese government is now fearful of the church because they fear they're losing their grip on power. In North Korea, we know that Bibles are being sent over by balloons. Father, your word will go throughout all the world and we pray Father God, that it will not return to you void, but Father, there will be many souls who trust in the life-saving message of Jesus. And Father, for the church in Australia, 
largely asleep, but Father, bit by bit, some are starting to wake up. Father, we do pray for the church in Victoria. We know that the Premier in Victoria, Father, has evil in his heart. We pray for Daniel Andrews, Lord. We pray that you would break his stony heart, that, Father, you would drive him to his knees, and that, Father, he would be convicted of the evil that he does in the name of politics. Oh, Father, we pray that he would be saved by the mighty hand of Jesus and that, Father, he would be a force for good and not evil. Lord, he has tried to ban prayer around certain points of view. Father God, we will never stop praying. And so, Father, we just pray that believers in that state in particular would rise up. They would rise up, Father, in spite of the consequences, in spite of the suffering that, Father, those in government might understand, as was shown in the life of Daniel, that we do not submit wholly to man's authority, but we submit to you. So, Father, I pray that you would continue to help us, strengthen us, embolden us for the days ahead, whatever they might be. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.